Now yeah. we know. Okay. <laughs> Eventually we get we get this. Yeah. So um, it's just us here. Why don't we just get started? Because <clears throat> um, it's very unpredictable what people will do. Uh, is that okay with you? Of course. Okay. Do you want to pre preamble? Can you see my screen? Uh, yes, I can. It's it's in the window. Perfect. So what I'll do is I'll <clears throat> briefly sort of introduce the session. So we have Helen Beale here, who's um, DevOps um, ambassador for the DevOps Institute, uh, based in the UK. And the topic today is um, measuring your DevOps API journey. Right. So it's uh, an interesting topic, um, and I look forward to finding out what it means. Um, <laughs> so, yeah. So just a brief introduction. Uh, um, I mean. Uh, to me, when I read Helen's profile, she's a tremendous influencer, uh, having won awards like the uh, Top DevOps Evangelist 2020 in the DevOps Dozen Awards, and is leading the DevOps and ways of working um, at the uh, DevOps Institute, and provides strategic advisory to a whole range of industry leaders, um, as well as working on events, content creation, and it seems pretty exhaustive. So the topic today, I will let uh, I will let Helen introduce um, on how to measure progress in the DevOps journey. Um, and I, I know uh, people are always asking how to get started. Uh, this seems to be a topic which will like extend that. So we're going to be having a few uh, slide decks and slides and introduction to that. And then uh, as people come in, we see what questions there are. And I also have some questions which were submitted earlier when people registered. So with that, Helen, I will hand it to you. Thank you very much, Jonathan. As Jonathan said, I'm Helen Beale. I'm Chief Ambassador at DevOps Institute. We actually have around 200 ambassadors worldwide across uh, all continents, apart from Antarctica. They're all pioneers in DevOps, um, like myself, with very different skill sets and experiences. Some work for vendors, some work for enterprises, um, many work for government agencies as well, and uh, the academia. I'm also chair of the Valley Stream Management Consortium, which we might get today, to today, or we might not. Let's see. Um, first of all, a little bit about DevOps Institute. DevOps Institute is a professional membership organization. Our purpose is to advance the humans of DevOps. Um, so you can become a member. There's lots of different membership levels, depending on what kind of organization or individuals you are as well. So do head on over to um, DevOps Institute site and see what member tiers are available. Today, we're going to be talking about ADOC, which is the assessment of DevOps capabilities and how it pertains to APIs. Um, that is a membership benefit uh, to have access to ADOC. And I'll explain how there's two different levels to it in a moment. Um, but as Jonathan just said, a question we get asked so often in the industry is where to start. And this is in the context of many different things. Of course, we're in a world where the internet um, has happened and is still happening. So digital disruption and digital transformation are key. And DevOps is a key enabler to making that happen. As I said, I'm really gonna drill into the relationship between DevOps and APIs in a moment. Um, but at DevOps Institute, we have developed a capability assessment and how this answers the question of where where do I start? The answer to that is you start where you are. So it doesn't matter if you consider yourself a completely greenfield site with no knowledge um, or experience about DevOps at all, or whether you think you've been on a DevOps journey for a number of months or years um, already, you just start where you are with any new initiative. One of the things I like to say around DevOps is I don't really like to use the word transformation. I know I just used it in the context of digital transformation a moment ago, and I've had to live with the fact that it has become an industry standard. But for me, transformation is very big bang. It's extremely disruptive to the business and the people um, that are working within an organization that tries to transform. So I often prefer to use more agile like terms like evolution and think of incremental change um, that has less negative impact when we try and address it. So the capability assessment can be used to baseline your current state, as it says just there. So help you understand where you're starting from. 
And then from that starting position, what the assessment does is it helps you identify your next target state. Some of you may be thinking this sounds familiar, particularly if you've done any DevOps Institute courses like DevOps Foundation, you will have come across lean tools like the Improvement Carter. And the Improvement Carter is a way to inject the habit of improving daily work into our lives. And it has these four steps. And if you haven't seen it before, your brain's probably going, why are the numbers in such a strange order, two, four, three, one? But if we think about um, the timeline of where your organization is, and I explain why the numbers are in that position, hopefully it will become clear. So the first thing we need to do is imagine that long-term vision. So that's you imagining um, what your organization would look like if it properly digitally transforms or achieves other goals that you want to have in order to um, become the organization you want to be. Step two is that baselining of the current state, so understanding where you are and where you're going to start from. And step three is understanding your next target state. And that could be quite multifaceted. So it could be we want to move towards re-architecting many of our applications around microservices and implement APIs, for example, along with we want to automate lots of our testing and we want to inject trust into our culture. There could be quite a few things there. And then step four, we plan to check out or PDCA or experiment between that baseline current state and our next target state. And we keep on doing this. It's incremental and it's continuous. So as I said, ADOC, the assessment for DevOps capabilities crowdsource, that means, do you remember a moment ago I talked about being chief ambassador and having 200 ambassadors that are all pioneers in this space? Um, those ambassadors are amazing at contributing to these types of materials. And we actually have 40 of them with about 600 years of experience across them um, of doing this type of work in real life organizations. It's completely vendor neutral. So we don't discuss specific tools in there. Uh, we talk about tools categories and it works for both individuals and teams and organizations. And I'll come back to that in a moment. Essentially, the capability assessment looks through five dimensions, as you can see here. So being very aware that culture and people and human aspects are so important, what we're doing, we start there. So we look at things like psychological safety, transformational leadership, of course, the three ways, which are flow, feedback and continuous experimentation. And we look at whether people are finding joy in their work um, and also things like diversity and inclusion. So things that are quite edge cases, perhaps in DevOps, but we think are core to making culture work. We move on to process and frameworks. And I've often talked about the DevOps super pattern in the past. And Jane Grohl, the CEO of DevOps Institute, often talks about the harmonious polygamous marriage between ITSM lean and agile that has this love child that is DevOps. But of course, there are so many processes and frameworks in our industry and so many contribute and overlap. And more recently, we saw the emergence of site reliability engineering, um, which contributes a lot uh, to DevOps as well. In functional composition, we really look at uh, the value stream end to end. So we look at where ideas start and how they pass through um, product development, how we manage change around them, how we architect so again, um, the link to APIs here is very clear. The architecture of an application, and I always hesitate when I say application because the, the, um, the concept of application is rapidly being eroded the more that we use microservices, um, but the concept of a monolithic application is not particularly helpful for what we're trying to do in DevOps. What we want is small parts because what we want is to be able to um, build and test and deploy very quickly. And for that, we require um, smaller components. So that, again, this is a, a very close link to why DevOps requires loosely coupled applications and why microservices and APIs are so important to us. Culturally as well, we've got a big focus on things like open source and inner source. So having the ability to share APIs and collaborate on APIs becomes very important in DevOps also. The fourth dimension is around intelligent automations. So this is really the DevOps tool chain. So this is where, how we look at how um, we actually uh, create our code and deploy our code and manage our code. And finally, we look at the surrounding ecosystems that we are deploying um, our work into. And we have 
in DevOps drawn a very clear correlation between the use of cloud technologies and approaches and principles of which APIs are considered one. It's difficult because in my mind, I've worked in the industry for quite a long time. I've worked um, since we saw the, the dawn of kind of e-commerce and then we saw e-business and there was a big thing around SOA, it's a service oriented architecture quite a long time ago in my career, but APIs are really, really hot at the moment. I'm quite aware of this. I, I moderated a panel with Nginx uh, just last week um, around APIs and learned lots of very interesting things I might come back to shortly, but they're yeah, very, very hot at the moment um, because they're so instrumental to us creating these kind of ecosystems um, that really allow us to accelerate organizational performance, which is ultimately what we're measuring in ADOC. I mentioned two, two versions. There's uh, the Team ADOC and the Enterprise ADOC. Team ADOC is available as a member benefit to all DevOps Institute premium members. It is a shortened version of Enterprise ADOC. So it has about 30 questions um, and it tells you, you answer the, the questions, they're actually statements, what we call Likert statements. So you say how much you agree or disagree with them, um, but it asks you to agree or disagree with around 30 statements across those dimensions. Um, and then as you can see on the screenshot here, it gives you an idea of where you are on DevOps capability adoption scale. And it actually gives you some recommendations based on your answers as well. So you answer it as an individual on behalf of your team. Um, Enterprise ADOC is available as a discounted benefit to enterprise members of the DevOps Institute. And this is really for cross enterprise uh, engagement, cross enterprise evaluation. So what you can do is have different teams answering um, the survey uh, as their own team, and then you can compare team capability across the organization. Um, caveats or, you know, warnings with that, health warnings, do not try and tell one team that they're really good and one team that they're really bad. Um, what you're trying to do is surface good practice or make local discoveries global improvements. This is not um, a carrot nor a stick. What this is, is a tool to help you help people self and teams self-discover improvements. I'm just going to check in with Jonathan and see if we've do how we're doing with the audience or whether he wants me to carry on with slides. How are we doing? So in terms of um, audience, it's pretty small. So uh, that's probably because there's so many other tracks running at the same time. Um, so far, it's been just really important to understand what ADOCS is. Uh, timing wise, you can um, you can carry on. I mean, we could carry on until 5.50, maybe beyond that, 5.55. Cool, I shall carry on then. So I just explained most of uh, team ADOCs. As I said, you get insights and recommendations. These are automated and you get four um, recommendations for your two weakest dimensions. Enterprise ADOC, as I said, is the full shebang. It's 180 statements. Again, it uses those Likert scales. Um, it's online, so it's delivered via a portal. Uh, and again, individuals complete it in the context of the teams, but this time you get that cross-organizational view where you can compare teams and, and wonder, ask yourself questions about why one team is particularly good on site reliability engineering, yet another team has yet to develop that particular capability. So there's lots of different challenges, as you can imagine, with 180 different aspects and uh, uh, there's a lot of different things that we're looking into. But from the API's perspective, things that we're particularly concerned about, as I said, is that ability to have a microservices based architecture where we can um, build, test and deploy very swiftly, where we're minimizing dependencies. That's a really key one for DevOps. Um, here we like to break dependencies, not manage them. Um, and then the other one that I really connect with it a lot as well is change. And the, the relationship between, between change and architecture is also very strong. And DevOps research has also shown that heavyweight change processes, by which we mean CABs, so change advisory and approval boards, um, really, really slow us down. They cause a lot of delay and a lot of pain into our flow of our value to our customers. So we want to try and eliminate those change boards. But when we've got a tightly coupled architecture, so those monoliths I talked about earlier on, it makes it really hard because we've got those dependencies. So when we've got lots of dependencies, we tend to have lots of bureaucracy and lots of controls. So we see things like release management teams, having release weekends and having caps. And all of that slows us down. 
So there's a very strong connection between microservices, APIs, loosely coupled architecture, having good change and having good flow. So as I said, it's an online report, an online tool. So what you get is a, a number of online reports that your consulting partner would review with you. So you can see here, we're seeing that build, develop and integrate receive, received the lowest overall scores for this organization, whereas um, overall diversity and inclusion were highest. And we've got ITSM and knowledge centric service varied the most. So we're already getting some insights at the high level topic analysis. But you can do things as well, like look at the capability distribution um, by team. So um, what we're seeing here is one particular team. We're seeing this particular team is scoring um, quite weak on scaling frameworks. So that's a conversation we need to have with them um, about whether they are using a scaling framework, whether they care about it, whether it would be useful for them, um, and have a look at other teams and see if they're benefiting from it. Here you're seeing um, different teams. You see different colors. So our orange team is team two. Red is team three, and what you're seeing is how they vary across those top level five dimensions. You can draw a line here and say, okay, so um, team three is doing pretty well on human aspects, excellent on process and frameworks, but they're struggling a bit on intelligent automation. What you see here is team one, the blue team is actually pretty strong on all. So it's worth exploring um, what's going on with each of them in more detail. We also have heat maps. So I love the heat maps because one of the things they do is enable us to see change happen over time. We've actually done a recent enhancement to make this look more like a Likert scale um, rather than using the Devils Institute colors here. But you can get the sentiment. Um, basically what we're saying is the pale greens and the pale blues and the dark blues are kind of at the lower end of the scale. And when we start getting into the burgundies and the gold, this is when we know um, that people are really performing. So as we can see um, over time here, we're seeing great improvements across uh, much of the board. So key takeaways um, around measuring your DevOps and API journeys. Um, APIs are your digital glue. They are the thing that helps us um, manage those dependencies in a way that allows us to break them at the same time. So an API um, creates an opportunity to link all of our, um, our services within our value stream um, without uh, needing to ask other people what to do. So we have the autonomy that we're really looking at. Um, and I mentioned Conway's law there because we build systems that um, build technology systems that replicate the communication systems in our organization. So if we have monoliths, um, it's because we've got silos and tightly coupled uh, team handoffs. Whereas if we can get to a place where we've got small autonomous teams, we are more likely to create technology systems that have small autonomous parts, i.e. microservices and APIs. Something I discovered the other day, actually, when I was doing that NGINX webinar, we were talking about what real-time APIs are. And I, um, one of the guys for NGINX um, was talking about some research, I think it was done by Microsoft, where they were looking at how long it takes the brain to recognize an image. And it's sub, um, or just sub 13 milliseconds. When we say real-time, that's what we mean. It needs to be just faster than the brain. So APIs are important for us to create loosely coupled systems. That allows us to have peer reviewed or lightweight change processes. That allows us to promote flow and fast feedback. We do recommend that you use the improvement carter when you're in any kind of improvement journey. So the first thing you need to do is understand your long-term vision and goals. Then you start where you are, so look at your current state, plan your next target state, and then experiment between those states. Importantly, you need to measure continuously. This isn't a once a quarter, once every six months, once a year job. This is every kind of sprint. So you need to make that data available. As you may have noticed on my intro, my mission is to bring joy to work. So one of the things I'm particularly interested in is how people experience joy. And we experience joy, one of the key ways is by making measurable progress. So using something like ADOC is a fabulous way for helping create a culture where joy exists at work, where people can measure how they're doing. A reminder, break dependencies, don't manage them. If you have the fast flow of value, you create a sublime customer experience. If you have sublime customer experience, you have a highly performant organization and you will survive in our digitally disrupted era. So thank you very much, Jonathan. Thank you, API Days, for the chance to talk about ADOC for a little while. And um, that was it from the slides perspective today. Mm. Thanks so much. I mean, that, that's an amazing journey that you covered in a short time. Like we have 20 minutes here. So um, I, we don't have any questions right now, but there were some questions earlier. And maybe we could use these questions to reinforce what you were just talking about. 
And I mean, the, the message I got was really driving for that state of flow and the people aspect of it and that reinforcement to keep people driving forward on their journey and happy. Um, so it's a very holistic approach. So one question that comes in again and again is what 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 is driving this sort of microservices, these loosely coupled system? Is it starting from dev and IT or is it starting from the business user need? All right. So you talked about APIs capabilities to influence organization. Um, so how does this fit into organization, organizational design and what's most likely to drive APIs forward? In the context of the question, is it from the business or is it from the, put it left and right, is it from the business or is it from the IT and development? So let's, there's quite a lot of questions in there. Let's start with them referring back to Conway's law. So Conway's law tells us that we create systems that replicate our organization or in fact our communication design. What we've got is a digitally disrupted world. So what we've got is organizations that are recognizing that they're not gonna survive unless they change their ways of working. And they need to ultimately change their ways of working in a way that allows them to deliver value faster and at high quality to their customers. So being very, very customer focused and focused on accelerating our workflows. Now that conversation in DevOps can happen what we call bottom up or top down. And it often in DevOps starts in the technology teams um, because uh, generally they're the ones that are doing the digital work. Um, we do across the whole industry have a really bad habit about talking about the business like it's some kind of separate entity. Um, and what we're seeing more and more is a movement from years ago, we were talking about aligning business and technology, and we talked about integrating, now we're seeing convergence, we're seeing statements like business, um, IT is the business, we are just connected. So this is one of the reasons I'm particularly passionate about value stream management. As I mentioned earlier, I'm the chair of the value stream management consortium, which was launched in March. What value stream management allows us to do is to stop thinking about departments and start thinking about the flow of value to our customers. So that separation between the business and the technology teams um, becomes completely irrelevant because we all we care about is the travel of the value from idea to realization. Hopefully that answered the question. Things are coming together, right? And it's not what there's no single answer to it, right? So people have to keep keep an open mind to this. Uh, this value chain or this interconnectivity and and how how the how the dots join together um, and using tools like adocs or approaches methodologies um, so look I think we're we're at the top of the session now I mean I, I could ask some more questions <laughs> and we, we could do that um, are you okay for that if I ask one more question well, one more would be great one more question. Okay, so let me read this question. It's a long question here. Let me try and get it right. So it's about breaking down monolithic systems into the microservices. And although the architectural approaches can help uh, to deliver it into smaller batches, right? They also potentially increase the complexity as we end up with a lot more moving parts than are needed. So um, how can tools like API gateways, like ADOCs, how can all this, this help to, to keep the balance right, reduce the complex complexity, yet remove the monolith over time? So ADOC doesn't particularly help. It's an assessment tool, so it can help people understand where they are on their journey and provide advice on where um, they go. So it might uncover um, problems with migration from monolith to microservices. Um, but as you said in the question, um, whilst there are huge advantages to moving towards the microservices and API-driven model in that we have um, smaller pieces, which allows us to do smaller pieces of work, which allows us to deploy quicker and get feedback quicker and pivot our business quicker around what our customers are wanting, um, what we end up with is lots and lots of very small parts. We often end up with duplication of parts. So things like um, API gateways and brokers and management systems like Nginx, for example, um, again, tools tools, spend, tools neutral, but just happen to have been doing some work with them lately, um, allow us to, to manage um, those, co those complex environments. Okay, so it's a bit of everything. So we have to be mindful when applying the, the methodologies and also the toolkits. 
All right, Helen, th thanks so much. Um, I think, let me see, is there any questions? No more questions here. So with that, I will end this round table. Have a good Thank afternoon. Jonathan, have a good Thank rest you. of your day. Bye for now. Bye.